Welcome everybody to our Air Miners Mayan Tailings event. Uh, music of the Rolling Stones, which is rock music to bring us in today. Um, you know, we at Air Miners are hoping that uh, this is a Mayan Tailing subject that you all dig. Um, so there's that. Uh, my name is Jason Grillo, the uh, event director uh, for air miners, wanted to welcome you all once again. Uh, just a quick note on operations and logistics for today before we get started. Uh, we'll go through our typical 45, minute, 45 minutes or so of panel discussion with people representing uh, industry, uh, startups, and uh, academia on the subject of mine tailings for carbon removal. Then we'll have QA at the at the end of that, you might even start Q&A a little bit earlier than that, we'll see, uh, so that we can hear your comments on this very enticing field. The event will be recorded, we'll put it on a YouTube channel afterwards, and at the top of the hour we'll stop and have our post-event networking for maybe half an hour as you typically do, so feel free to hang around for that if you've got time, because I know this is something that you all want to drill down on. Anyway, uh, without any, without further ado, and without any more puns, uh, I'm going to hand the uh, event over to the very capable hands of Siobhan Montoya Lavender, who is going to be a moderator. Siobhan. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I, for one, am really pumped about this subject and to hear from our panelists today. Um, I'm Siobhan Montoya Lavender. I organize the Carbon Mineralization Learning Group here at Air Miners. I see some familiar faces. Hi, everyone. Um, and I also have a project called thanksaton.earth uh, where I gift carbon dioxide remover with, removal with my co-founders. Um, okay, so let's jump into our amazing panelists today. We have a really great um, spread here for you guys to learn and discuss. Please feel free to drop um, questions into the chat and then we'll kind of pull them as we go. You know, don't wanna forget anything as we're going here. Um, first of all, Wave, we have Laura uh, de Bonaventura. She is working with Rockfix out of Stanford on mineralization, and she brings strategy and business model experience from years and years at McKinsey and e-commerce startup life. Then we have Peter Shoreman. Hi, Peter. He is the co-founder and CTO of Carbon Minerals, a startup out of the University of British Columbia that's developing technologies to accelerate carbon mineralization in mine tailings. We also have Catherine Vazgones. She's a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania and a science advisor to Carbon Direct. Her dissertation looks at the engineering, economics, and policy of carbon storage in mine tailings. So there you go, really knowledgeable group we've got here. All right, so I think we wanna kind of just dig in with some of the basics to start off here. So this one I'm gonna to throw to Catherine. Can you talk to us just a little bit about what the process of using mine tailings for mineralization projects entails um, and what for those that aren't familiar, what's happening here in using mine tailings? Happy to start us off, Siobhan. So uh, start, you know, what, what is a mine tailing in the first place? And it's really a, a rock or a group of rocks that have been kind of considered a waste from an original mining process. And tailings might be designated as tailings because of either their composition, their particle size, or some other attribute that really made them left without a use by the original or primary operation. And so with mine tailings, we're looking at very plentiful sources of calcium magnesium that we need for carbon mineralization. Not to mention mine tailings can often come with really harmful effects to the environment if they aren't dealt with properly in terms of you know, ecosystem hazards. And so with mine tailings, we have the opportunity to take the magnesium and calcium that are in this very you know, abundant source of rock that I'm sure we'll get into just how abundant soon. Um, and there are a few options for thinking about the mineral mineralization. You know, there's a direct carbonation approach where you uh, use CO2 and water directly with the mine tailings to produce carbonates. There's also an indirect carbonation approach, which is what my dissertation looks at, which is where you leach magnesium and calcium out of the rock and then carbonate the resultant fluid. Um, and this CO2 can be used from either point source or direct air capture. And there's a myriad of different treatments and ideas out there for how to correctly get this calcium magnesium unlocked from these tailings and use it for mineralization. Awesome. Siobhan, yeah. can I add a footnote for please, the please non jump in. technical folks? 
it surprised me to learn when I started on this journey that mind tailings are a little like a slurry of baking soda and water. And, you know, most people, I think lay people, when they picture mining, they picture big rocks turning into small rocks when in fact the surface area of tailings begins at the size of a grain of sand and gets smaller. So what we're really dealing with is an enormous quantity of sort of aqueous solution with calcium and magnesium ions in it. Just thought I'd add that. Yeah, I think that's helpful in breaking it down. Peter, why, why use mine tailings? Why bother? Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the main reasons is that there's kind of a double benefit for climate, um, especially in the critical metal space. So we all know, well, we're all aware that the world is on a path forward of electrification, and that's going to require significant more quantities of copper, lithium, nickel, et cetera. Um, and so mining of those metals is going to increase. And so if we can use the waste from those metal mines to capture carbon and actually make net negative um, mining operations, that's really a, a one-two punch and really a strong motivation to do this. Yeah. Agreed. So Peter, um, carrying on that theme, can you just break down for us a little bit about what is in mine tailings? What are we looking for for mineralization product projects? And what are we looking to avoid? What are things that A, aren't going to be useful or could be hazardous? Like when you're looking for mine tailings, what are you really looking for? Yeah, so Catherine mentioned this at the very beginning is rocks that are super rich in calcium and magnesium. Um, so, and actually we at UBC and as Carbon Minerals, the company are focused on the magnesium end of the spectrum. So these are ultra mafic rocks, um, rich in magnesium iron, that's kind of the geological definition of them. And then in terms of, uh, for CDR, you want um, those deposits that have a, a content or a high percentage of minerals that'll dissolve quickly at ambient conditions or at conditions that don't require high pressures and temperatures. And so in our experience, that's you're looking at the olivines, the serpentines and the brucites. Um, so those are all minerals. Olivine is a magnesium iron silicate, same with serpentine. And then brucite is um, a really fast reacting. It's just magnesium and water essentially. And how many mines would you say, um, mine tailings that is, have these ultramafic rocks available and accessible? Like what do you think, like what percentage of US, that might not be a question you know, but what percentage of US mines or, or what's kind of the volume you're seeing? Yeah, so this is an important question. It's also a tricky question to answer. Um, so there was a report either last year or the year before from the Sustainable Minerals Institute out of, it's one of the university of, um, one of the Australian universities. And they basically gave um, tailings production volumes. And if you're looking just at nickel and diamond, which are generally, but not always conducive to mineralization, it's about 550 megatons per year of tailings. And so that's a great number. Like everyone gets excited about that. Um, and is it, it is exciting because there is a lot of potential here. Um, so that's kind of your TAM, your total addressable market. You can think of it that way. And then, but nailing, like drilling into the details um, of a specific deposit and what's actually operable um, takes a, quite a bit of legwork. Um, so that's what we've been doing at UBC for quite a while. And it involves like actually getting samples from the mine and then processing and then analyzing them because you can't, um, you can't just take like a, you can't just, paint a broad brush and say that all the tailings from specific deposit are going to be um, reactive to the CO2, because we know that's just not true, so. Yeah. Laura, you're working with some current um, mines. Can you talk to us a little about how you found them and, and what you were looking for and, and how you approached them? Sure. Um, to segue off of Peter's observation, uh, quite right, that nickel, for example, has really superior carbon uptake or CO2 uptake, but there are mining companies and mines that have massively more, greater volume and much slower uptake. Take copper tailings, for example, you have on the order of 2 billion tons um, a year versus maybe a hundred, the numbers that Peter quoted. Um, and while nickel's uptake could be four times of the, the order of magnitude, um, the scale of copper's volume is, is you know, 20 times nickel, and that makes it 
interesting. So that's one of the ways you think about approaching mining companies. You know, what is the mineral composition of what it is they're working with? And mining is both a geographically distributed, but a fairly concentrated industry in terms of its ownership structure and the companies. And one of the key aspects of finding partners in mining is to think about, am I talking to the right level or the right kind of person? Um, very often startups imagine that they have to find their way into the C-suite, whereas in mining, the geographic distribution and the autonomy of mine managers um, lend itself to finding, if you will, an operating partner who believes in the solution that they want to test in some kind of fe feasibility study and is willing to put a little bit of budget towards it in the mine that he or she controls. So my advice to startups would be find the mineral composition you're looking for, find specific mines that are working on that. And through the via, via, via of many talks and many interviews and many um, networking attempts, find your way to a, an operating champion in those mines um, who can get into the, the nitty gritty of your solution and wants to really test it out. That's good advice. Could you tell us a little bit more about like, what was your process? How long did it take, for example, for you to like kind of connect with and get agreements going with the very first mine? Was that a year process, a two month process? So well, full disclosure, we do not have signed agreements with mining companies. We have um, verbal interest. And if I just use the startup that I'm working with as an example, and it by no means is you know, comparable to all efforts, I would say the rule of thumb in startups is 50 to 100 interviews. That sounds crazy, but when you start triangulating your way via academia, via um, other startups, other VCs, uh, people in industry, um, and have on your side of the phone or the Zoom folks with mining experience who can bring credibility, scientific and technical, um, then you will find your way to folks in the mine. So to be more specific, the, the leaders like Rio, the Rio Tintos of the world often have, I'll call them research designated mines where they're trying out lots of new technologies. So they're already open to the idea of feasibility studies. Um, and Rio Tinto, for example, as with others have made these net zero pledges where they both recognize their commitment to reduce their own emissions and the market opportunity of additional um, carbon sequestration beyond the emissions negative targets of their own. Yeah, okay. Okay, very cool. And so let's talk a little bit, something that comes up in the learning group sometimes is the difference between legacy mine tailings and active mine tailings. And I think for anybody looking to venture into using mine tailings as a feedstock, they really wanna understand what um, the pros and cons are and kind of what the capacity is too. Are there more legacy mines? Are there more active mines? What are kind of the benefits to, for example, Laura, I think you're using active mines, you're communicating with active mines. Sure. Can you sure. talk to us about what, why that choice? Sure. I'll, um, you know, we're in a situation where it's really all of the above. It's the IPCC is making it abundantly clear. It's all hands on deck. So um, we are super excited about both active and passive solutions, and they both have significant pros and cons. An active solution is largely an engineering solution that would exist within the mill as the tailing, the rock is being ground and the tailings are being processed. So that material, it's already being moved. It already has energy embedded into it. It's, uh, it's existing in a place with an established business, an established set of engineering skills and established permitting. Um, and the improving the, uh, or sequestering CO2 in active tailings produces an end result that can have co-benefits around stabilizing tailings in their passive dams when they're stored um, and possibly reducing chemical leaching risks. But the downside is you're at the mercy of the mill and of production, scale up, scales down and economics. Um, we found talking to mining companies as the commodity prices were soaring, you know, it's, they just wanna get as much rock out the door as they possibly can. And I imagine when, when prices really fall, um, there's no money around for extra feasibility studies. So you have to find the, the sweet spot. Um, briefly on passive, and then I want to hand it to Peter, who knows a lot more about passive than I do. Um, 
the tailings dams are really almost incomprehensibly massive in scale. So you have this massive physical opportunity um, with very low cost because you're working with atmospheric carbon, but you do run the risk of, of um, altering the stability, the geotechnical stability and the chemical composition of such a massive quantity of tailings. So, and that runs permitting and license to operate risks, which are significant. So I'll hand it to Peter about that. Yeah, Peter, and, and stabilizing tailings is a really interesting co-benefit concept. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that? Peter? Yeah, um, so let me start with that one and then I'll talk about the passive. Um, so the idea here is um, basically cementation of tailings through the formation of these secondary carbonates. So it's either magnesium or calcium. Um, so this is something that some of the, it's, it's I, my understanding is this is still at the research stage. Um, I know here at UBC, uh, some of the grad students have done a number of uh, experiments where you would take kind of a, a core of unconsolidated or unreacted tailings and then expose it to concentrated CO2 for uh, a period of time. And then the results of those experiments say that the, the pressure at the end of it or the strength actually is you know comparable or even greater than uh, ready mixed concrete. So moving that you know out into the real world, if, if you could stabilize tailings, that would be fantastic at a large scale. Um, since there is there have been some recent tailings dams failures across the world that have really put the safety and liability of tailings kind of high on high on the mining industry's priority list. So that co-benefit would be excellent. And then the second, oh, no, Catherine, continue. you want to jump in there? Yeah, I thought maybe Catherine, is there anything to kind of follow on that with the stabilization aspect? Yeah, yeah, thanks guys. Uh, just going kind of back to the idea of like using legacy mine tailings versus active tailings. So currently in my dissertation, I'm working with uh, four mines, two of which are active mines across the US and the other two are actually abandoned asbestos mines uh, with many, many legacy tailings in these kind of abandoned sites where these old mines used to sit. And I think in the case of the active mine tailings, you definitely have the, you know, the volume and the production case that they're coming kind of clean off the conveyor belt. But in terms of legacy mine tailings, especially when you're thinking about asbestos mining, which ended in the United States back in the 1990s, um, these tailings are a little bit more closer in mineralogy to some of the serpentines um, and the brucites that Peter mentioned earlier that have high magnesium and calcium content. Uh, magnesium content specifically. And secondly, they also pose really serious environmental risks and hazards and respiratory risks to the nearby environment. So even if we don't kind of use them for carbon storage and in carbonville, there's a massive kind of issue with legacy tailings that somebody should pick up and try and think about one day if we don't get our hands on them. I like that attitude. Somebody should pick it up. There's a lot of people on this call. Somebody pick it up. Peter, you want to talk a little bit about passive? Yeah, I mean, we see an opportunity um, in legacy tailings. Uh, we don't think of them as like the long-term uh, feedstock just because there are, um, there's issues handling and moving them um, since they're not, it's not an active mine. But uh, we see legacy tailings as a great place to pilot technologies um, for extended periods of time under a range of climactic conditions. Um, and specifically, so carbon minerals is right now we're focused on direct air capture and storage in tailings. Um, so the ability, we probably need, you know, several square kilometers and that's all available at these legacy sites. So they definitely have potential in the, in the near term to prove out technology and help it, you know, move up the TRL chain. Yeah. And Peter, what are you seeing in carbon minerals? Um, what are you seeing as like, the biggest hurdles that you're facing right now as a startup working with mine tailings, you know, trying to do these, these carbon mineralization projects, what's kind of like, oh, that we always run up against that hurdle. Yeah, I think um, doing this safely is going to be key um, because like I mentioned, there have been tailings dams failures in the past five to 10, five to 15 years. Um, so doing this safely and Kind of at smaller scales and proving to the industry that it's feasible. Um, I think that is a high priority in the near term. Okay. And Catherine, similar question. Like, what do you see? Because I know you're in the lab, you're digging into all of this. Um, what are the things you're coming up maybe on more like the technical side with, with actually, you know, performing mineralization? What are you coming up against in terms of hurdles? Yeah. 
Um, well, I'll, I'll go policy first, and maybe we'll come back to technical, because my original answer to that question was actually going to be towards policy incentives for processes like these, that, that mineralize mine tailings, especially because right now in the United States, we have the 45Q tax credit that offers, I believe it's about $135 per ton of CO2 that's uh, stored in the subsurface of the earth and $35 per ton for carbon that's used in a useful product. Uh, currently, if you store your CO2 in a mine tailing and you produce a carbonate above ground, you don't have access to that higher premium, despite the fact that it's still durable permanent carbon storage. And so I think that if the US government or other governments in the world could kind of cling on to that fact and work quickly to think about how to incentivize durable carbon storage that's not in the subsurface, I think we'd really see a lot of change in play in this space. Yes, and incentives, I think, is, is a crucial thing we should be talking about here. Um, Laura, how, how would you frame like the economic incentives here? How would you frame, how do you pitch this to, to mines to partner with or, or where do you see this being economically viable? Sure. In fact, it's really kind of the same answer around what the current obstacles are to grow a business in this space. Um, and I would have put the business model high on the list. Um, right now, as we've talked about, part of the value of sequestering carbon in tailings is around the co-benefits that we imagine exist in terms of stabilizing tailings, dams, and minimizing chemical leaching of uh, various acids. But quantifying the risk reduction value to the mining company is a real challenge. Um, of course, they have insurance expense, but it's really more directly related to the license to operate and the ability to acquire permits to bo both open mines, expand mines, or, or um, do more with their existing mines. So capturing those kind of co-benefits economically is a challenge. And then as Catherine was talking about, the direct economic benefits of sequestering carbon, it's really a wild west in terms of there's there, there are these two incentives driven largely by the oil and gas industry and yet to really reach you know, uh, mining mineralization. Um, and then there's the open market, which we saw today in Frontier's announcement of their uh, pre-buy fund, which is fantastic. Um, and there are these sort of tip of the spear buyers, but for a, for a startup to think about who are these customers going to be where I can sell this? Is it gonna be the mining company? Um, what would they be willing to pay relative to the other volunteer emissions credits they could buy, voluntary credits like in forestry and soil? Um, and what kind of pricing can I anticipate? That's a really hard thing to forecast with any real rigor um, because we don't yet see in the marketplace, where's the second wave behind the frontier? We believe they're out there. Fortune 500 companies are making net zero pledges and many of them have no path to zero. They're gonna be 10 billion uh, tons of CO2 negative emissions demanded in just a few decades. So market forces are in place, but there are no players just yet stepping up, neither the government incentives nor the private marketplace. So we need to make this happen as a, as a network, as a community. It has to drive iteratively. We have to come up with solutions, find individual customers, demonstrate viability, and have it grow from there. Okay. Yeah, sounds like a lot of work. Peter, how's that been going for you? Can you speak a little bit to your process with your startup and and how you've approached it? Yeah, so where we sit is, um, at least now in 2022, is we do see kind of a double-sided market. Um, and as Laura mentioned, the carbon removals, Wild West is appropriate. There aren't um, a lot of, well, there are no, like Catherine mentioned, protocols for uh, ex situ mineralization. So yeah, we see this two-sided market. Um, what we're inter interested in doing is kind of the vision that we see is if we could take a mine to net zero, um, then the mining company themselves would pay for that service and that implementation of, implementation of our technology. And to the extent we're able to take a mine carbon negative, those additional credits could be sold theoretically at a higher value to the carbon removal space. Um, and so this is this is the frontiers of the world um, at this point in time. But yeah, it's definitely very early days, and I, I think a lot's gonna. There's a lot of um, a lot of ducks that need to line up before you know you can say we're gonna go left or right at this at this fork in the road. Um, can I add too that our partners at Airminers in the DAC world 
are definitely partners in the mineralization space, right? At, we can use atmospheric CO2. Um, I think there are good folks working on that, but there's also the notion, particularly in active tailings of creating an engineering solution using what I'll call low quality or, or low concentration CO2, which should be priced significantly lower than the pure CO2 that some of the DAC companies are producing using low concentration CO2 cheaply um, in the process to create a, I'll say cost effective um, cost per ton that could be both for the mining company relative to its alternatives and driving down its own emissions uh, accounting, but also on the open marketplace. So CO2 acquisition at, at a good cost is an important issue as well. Just like to hop on to that. Yeah, uh, I do. Too. So we're thinking about like promising pathways forward. I'm definitely you know a fan of deploying direct air capture and plus one to everything that both Peter and Laura just said. But even more than just thinking about on-site flue gas and even point source capture on-site at mines and using that to carbonate tailings, you know, also asking the questions if mines have anything else that might be kind of a hidden resource that they could use for those carbonation processes, whether that be waste heat or other reagents on site that they might not even consider to be a resource that could be valuable in getting this mineralization reaction to happen on their site. Catherine, how important would you say in, in thinking about this happening on site, how important would you say is like modularity of technologies? Like how important is it to co-locate processes together as opposed to, you know, hurting the LCA, the life cycle analysis by, by spreading processes? What's, what's going on there? I would say incredibly important to both of those things. On the point of modularity, we know that modularity brings technology down the cost curve. We've seen it with solar panels, we've seen it with batteries. So the more modular, the better, because you can really learn by doing and move your, your technology down the cost curve, which is really important as we're trying to get under $100 per ton in CO2. Um, and then your second question about like geospatial co-location, I think that's also a really key question here because mines are all over the world and they all have different amounts of resources. They all have different individual kind of case studies that need to be designed for and thought of because you're trying to locate your tailings, your CO2 source, any reagents that you may need in your process, um, and also disposing of any other waste materials that happen as a result of your mineralization process. So absolutely gold star to both of those points that you just brought up, Siobhan. And I'll add modularity should be thought, uh, sort of mental model for the business model also. And that there's an argument to be made, like you go to the low hanging fruit first. If there are mines with favorable mineral, mineral characterizations who have point source CO2 generation, perhaps through burning diesel fuel or having a legacy coal fired power plant, you know, you're combining already solutions to multiple multiples of the list of the, your, your challenges. You're, you have CO2, you have the right minerals, you have the right ambition by the mining company. Um, and that allows you, again, with a modular solution, such as the one Rockfix is working on, um, to do these feasibility studies on site, drive down the cost curve and get to the cost per ton that you need to be, be at. Yeah. Um, okay, so thinking about, I'm gonna ask a question that I think is kind of unfair because this is such a burgeoning industry, um, but everyone always wants to know about scalability and everyone wants to know kind of like, what's the capacity of this technology to get us to gigaton level? Um, and so please feel free to say caveats. These are our guesses at this point, um, but I'd love to hear from each of you kind of like how you see this landscape in terms of capacity and using mine tailings for mineralization. What do you think is the annual gigaton or ton level we could get to by 2050? Catherine, you go first. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll go first for that one then. Um, so I think if we look at mine tailings widespread in general, I believe there is a mineralization roadmap that came out of Columbia, I think late last year, if I have my timelines correct. And I loved one of the statistics that was inside of it because it basically claimed that in the United States in the year 2016 alone, we made 38 million Olympic swimming pools of tailings. That's a lot. We are literally swimming in these things. So theoretically, the sky is basically the limit, right? If we can figure out how to make the chemistry happen economically, there might be a world where we mineralize all of that. Now, that being said, I also work with mines whose tailings are not so reactive to CO2 and need a bit of extra touch of some chemistry and engineering to get the job done. 
Um, so even if we're not using them for mineralization, there's also the opportunity to use tailings for co-recovery of different met metals and rare critical minerals, rare earth elements that might be in small quantities in them. So I would say sky is the limit, but we have 38 million swimming pools a year of this material coming out. We got to figure out where we're going to put it because we're going to run out of space soon. And that is a joke. I don't actually have a statistic on that one. <laughs> all right, Laura, what do you think? You know, yes to all of the above. The constraint is, is not availability of mineralizable tailings. Like copper alone, and I'm going to mispronounce this, the copper VMS and the copper parfir, pardon me, it's my non-geology background, as something on the order of 2 billion tons of tailings a year uh, in terms of the potential CO2 um, absorption. So it's really, you know, when you think about the, the the IPCC goal of 10 billion negative emissions tons by 2050, mining can be perhaps the largest player in that, in that um, with a com combined effort around DAC or CO2 acquisition and sequestration, it's global scale impact and fantastic. Okay, yeah, and Peter, what do you think? Yeah, so I um, I think Catherine hit it on the head really well. Um, it's the capacity I see as, as a problem. It's the kilograms of CO2 that you can get into every kilogram of tailings. Um, because as they've, uh, Catherine and Laura have both spelled out yet, supply is not, the, uh, is not a limiting factor here. Um, so we do definitely need to focus on, you know, how do you bump up that, the capacity on a, on a kilogram basis to make this, um, to help it scale to the megaton and potentially gigaton scale. Because right now we know that mines, you know, big, large nickel mines are producing enough tailings that if you were to carbonate all of it, that's, you know, four megatons of CO2 a year, and then multiply that by, you know, in excess of 30, 50 nickel mines globally, plus all the other ones, um, you're talking very serious numbers. But again, I think it's that capacity. Um, the, how do you actually get the CO2 into the rock uh, quickly? Okay. And what, um, speaking, you know, like uh, Catherine brought up, you know, sometimes there can be hazardous materials are involved and whatnot. Let's talk a little bit about like the risks involved. Uh, what are the risks and hazards in using mine tailings for mineralization projects? Are there any kind of environmental justice concerns? Are there any community impacts that we should be thinking about? Everyone on this call, do you think, how are we going to scale this industry? Because we all want to. Um, what are the risks? Anybody? I'll just jump out. You know, mines exist in very remote places and they're, they're not sort of human scale, right? So imagine this technology works and we're all, you know, high-fiving us around the, uh, around the world and we believe that massive sequestration can take place. Um, the accounting of that and the verification of that, it's, I, I, my understanding is it's fairly easy chemically to understand, you know, this rock weighed this much before and now it weighs this much and the difference is the CO2 sequestration. Okay, great. But the administrative oversight of measuring and, and making sure that those claims are accurate and that they're not greenwashing or, or wishful thinking uh, on the project's part is really important. So I think there's a, there's a social justice aspect to being um, truthful and responsible in actually measuring what is actually being done and, and reporting that in a consistent and rigorous way. I would back everything that Laura just said in terms of monitoring, reporting, and verification of this process, you know, to a high standard. Um, and also to, to bring up what you brought up, Siobhan, about like worker safety and, and doing this process healthily. You know, tailings do can come with risk. They don't always come with risk in terms of crystal and silica or other respiratory hazards. So it's really about looking at those Department of Labor standards just to make sure workers are protected and local ecosystems are, are protected. Yeah, makes sense. Peter, anything to add? Yeah. Um I would say thinking into the future as new mines come online to fuel electrification of, you know, everything, um, making sure that the local communities are, you know, up to date with what's going on in the mineralization space and that they have an active participation in that. Um, that's something we're definitely thinking about and thinking of ways to 
kind of meld the, the two, the carbonation and the impact, uh, participation of local communities. Laura, would you say that's hard given like kind of mining reputation? Oh, I know mining reputation point. varies, but can you speak a little bit to that? Like how hard is it to incorporate communities given the fact that if you're working with a mine, there might already be a barrier there, right? That's a great point because uh, historically mining, I would say, has not had the best reputation in the communities outside of where they operate. I mean, it is an extractive, historically polluting and very historically colonialist practice. I'm not in any way implying that's in the minds of the mining operators today, but it has had a legacy of some significant challenges. So credibility, you know, uh, it, particularly in certain geographies with certain history has been tough. I know Peter mentioned the, um, the physical risk and the, the tailings dams failings. There's a report out about mining safety that identifies I don't have the number in my head, but scores of mines built pre-1990 without the same safety protocols um, and a single mining disaster. I think the recent one that people are referring to cost $7 billion and 250 lives. So um, I'm kind of getting off track in saying the social contract between a mine and, and the population and its environs is really important. Um, and I'm sorry, Siobhan, I've lost the detail of your question, but um, if you could repeat it, I'm happy. No, I, th I think you answered that. well. I think I think you're you're tackling the the challenging issue of like, yeah, how do you work with you know within the mining existing structure and ecosystem and oh. communities and trying to keep this above board, right. trying to make sure revenue streams are are benefiting local communities and all that. I think it's a challenging topic, and maybe it's maybe your answer of like building into the business model kind of is yeah is part of that. And I just as a footnote, I want to say like. Mining companies have worn the black hat for a long time, uh, which is where I was going with that narrative. And I imagine they're eager to, to lean into the contribution that can be made in addressing um, the need for negative emissions. I regard this as a fantastic opportunity to bring an old legacy industry forward to, to really be a mover and shaker at massive scale around um, carbon mineralization. I like that attitude. All right, we're going to go into some audience questions because there's lots coming from the audience. I appreciate it. Keep them coming. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, let me pull some up here. Okay, so uh, Michael has a question. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about extracting high value stuff from tailings like scandium, magnesium, et cetera. How would mining companies consider these different options? Anybody? I can start to answer that. Um, so in, in thinking about mine tailings, we have these you know, large amounts of this plentiful resource that has plenty of magnesium and calcium in it, but could also come with other, you know, quote unquote, good stuff. And we've seen with the energy transition that we're going to need large amounts of lithium, scandium, nickel to be able to power renewable energy, electric vehicles to electrify our system. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, the U.S. government has started to look at is reprocessing mine tailings to take out um, additional critical minerals and rare earth elements that are necessary for the energy transition. Now, I think if you're asking, can you, should you be uh, extracting these minerals or should you be carbonating? I think the answer is you can be doing both. Uh, if you're already leaching out magnesium and calcium in a chemical process, you're probably leaching out other metals too. So at that point, it becomes a separations problem, which is a chemical engineer's favorite problem. So that would be my kind of 90 second pitch to that answer, but happy for other people to jump in. Anything else on that one? Let's, let's move on. There's lots of questions coming in. So actually, why don't, I think we're a, a manageable group. Um, why don't we have people come off, off mic and they can ask the questions live if they want and, and get into the action here. Um, Jonathan Hennick, did you have a question you wanna come off uh, mute and, and ask your question? I did, but I think Catherine just nailed it, which is, can you, can, are you locking up other metals? But it sounds like you can do both. Yeah. Okay. Well done, Catherine. Precognition. Okay. Um, ben, Tink, do you, do you have a question you want to ask? I saw you come up earlier. I'm not sure you can come off mute. Sorry, Sean. Uh, but I think Kara had a plus one to that or follow up to that question. Okay. Kara, you want to jump in? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I was just wondering about um, enhancing reaction kinetics and 
what kind of accelerants are being considered, what have, what's been tested in the lab, and uh, what might be tested in a pilot project on site. Thanks. I'm going to beg off of that and ask to follow up with you after this about what we're looking at in Rockfix, if that's all right. I can say it's a pretty elegant um, sort of not very hot reaction at ambient, uh, low pressure, low heat with fairly common chemical reagents because our, our notion is if, it, if, it, if it's too complicated and too expensive, we can't scale it. So I think of it as sort of a beer brewery system, large tanks, large slurries passing through, not too hot, not too pressured. Catherine, anything to add maybe? Yeah, I can, I can jump in um, and maybe just talk about some broader themes that exist in the literature. Because uh, again, what I work with is mainly an indirect carbonation, which is what I've, I've mentioned a few times now. It's that bleaching of the material and the carbonating of the resultant fluid. Um, and so there, you know, there are a few things to think about. People in literature have tried chemical treatments with things from acids and kind of um, more rough reagents, biological treatments by bacteria and algae to leach out that calcium magnesium, physical treatments in, in grinding, um, and what I would call the, the crazy other category of things like microwaves and radiation. Um, and really, when we're thinking about these lab solutions and these lab treatments that are being done at the small scale to accelerate that reaction, uh, you want to think about both the low uh, embodied emissions of any reagents that you're adding, consider the emissions that are going to come as a result of scaling of that process and energy usage. And you're also going to have to think about the capex and opex at scale. So is it worth it to add that extra step, that extra chemical? Are you getting that much of a carbon benefit? Um, so in short, there are a lot of things being thrown at accelerating that reaction. I'm glad you're working on it. Andre, I see you have your hand up. You want to jump in and ask a question? Sure, thank you. Um, let me lower my hand here. Um, I, I should give a bit of background. Uh, I've been working as an environmental con uh, consultant to the mining industry for 32 years. I'm very, very familiar with the industry. Uh, and the reason why I say that is that the industry, the mining industry is a community. There's people on the inside, there's people on the outside. And uh, the trust is given readily to people within the community, not so to people outside of the mining community. So you may feel that working at Stanford gives you a gold star and a place to start, but actually you're an outsider. Um, so, so you have to appreciate this as this group. Uh, UBC has a long established uh, reputation and relationship with the mining industry. So you have a leg up, let's say on, on others, Peter, but uh, that, that goes only so far. Um, having said that, the industry is evolving, <laughs> is opening up to new possibilities, new ideas. It is not a stale industry. It is an industry that embraces research and development. And I say that to encourage you, in fact, not to discourage you. Um, the second point I want to make is that uh, three years ago, I had looked at a startup at starting a company to uh, store captured carbon in tailings. Uh, at the time, I developed a business plan. I went fairly far with it. At the time, I let go of it because there was far too much uncertainty in so far as regulation, in so far as the landscape was concerned. Um, I'm actually pleased to see that three years later, the landscape is, is quite different and, and I encourage you to pursue it. Um, However, some of the issues that I encountered at that time are relevant here, and these are questions that you ought to ask yourselves. Uh, one of them is that as a startup, your focus is on process, on how to fix carbon dioxide in reaction with tailings. Um, but if this process is going to work, and if you're considering 20 or 50 megatons per year, 
you're looking at a large scale materials handling operation. And that's what mining companies are really good at. They, they can handle the process. There's many di different people coming up with process, but in terms of material handling, the mining companies are good at that. So that translates into partnerships that between a startup and a mining company that translates into these kinds of relationships where the miners do what they're really good at, which is large scale material handling, and the startups do what they're really good at, which is developing new ideas and making them work. Um, I, I think it's a helpful perspective to maintain. Um, now, the question is, where are you going to store 50 to uh, uh, 20 to 50 megatons per year? It's yeah, not a trivial be. question. Uh, I mean, strictly speaking, from the mining standpoint, you're happy if you mine 20 million tons of rock per year or whatever. You know, you, even in terms of moving a ton of rock, it's still very, very difficult and laborious in terms of the equipment that you have to use, the, the hauling trucks, the cost or the, the, the fuel, all of that. So you have to think of the process in terms of, are you gonna store it in the pit? Or are you gonna store it into an impoundment? Um, and that may be a detriment, but in fact, it opens some opportunities. And I see two opportunities that exist uh, from my standpoint. One of them alludes to what Peter has referred to, which is the mining disasters of breaching of dams. Invariably, all of them have occurred when they have saturated tailings flooded with water and, and the water breached the dam for any of a number of reasons and, and broke through and released the tailings. The focus now of mining companies is on dewatering tailings. It's a very expensive process. You put tailings through a centrifuge. The reason for it is that the processing of tailings to extract the, 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 the value uses water and you produce this slurry. So oh. now you have to extract the water out of it, which is expensive. Dewatering tailings is an active area of research. If you could combine that with capturing carbon and producing a cement-like material, then you solve the problem of where you store it and how you deal with the material afterwards. Sounds, yeah, it sounds like storage is a, is a key it's a really important issue. Here. It's a really do, important issue. Do any of our panelists want to jump in mm -hmm. on kind of like solutions around storage or ideas around storage? Because again, this is all very nascent, right? We're, we're, we're discovering as we go. And I think to your point, like hum bringing humility into this process and recognizing that we're all starting at a very, at a very basic level, trying to build up this massive industry is, is a really good place to start. And of course, partnerships are going to be incredibly critical in that. Um, anybody well, want to talk about storage? Siobhan, I'd like to jump in because yeah. I, I thought, Andre, your comments were fantastic. I just first want to agree with you with my observations based on my limited experience about the mining industry. They are very progressive and highly skilled. If in any way I conveyed a criticism of their interest in moving forward and their ability to do so, then that was a misperception because we're super enthusiastic about the mining companies that we've spoken to and their interest in this topic. Second is Stanford doesn't confer expertise, you earn it. And there are two people on our Rockfix team. One is a mining engineer who's worked in the US, Canada and Venezuela and the other is a PhD geologist who spent years at Baghdad and Arizona. So yes, I am. we are aware that coming from within the industry creates a kind of collegiality that's important. And I can't imagine any startup without some connections to the industry having the same opportunity to succeed as one without. So agree with you on that. The point about storage and mine failings, uh, sorry, tailings, dams, failings, and the opportunity to um, de-aquify tailings is a really interesting space. I'm unaware of startups working on that, but that would, do a whole bunch of things in addition to provide capacity for um, um, the incoming tailings that are imagined as we scale up mining. Um, but it would also obviously improve the geotechnical stability of it. So 
From a rock fix point of view, looking at active, active tailings in the mill, our expectation was to send it where all the rest of the tailings are going, which is often in overcapacity stress dams that do the mining companies are trying to expand and add permitting for new dams. So we encourage anyone in the space to work together um, to address those other issues. Thanks for bringing those up. Thank you for your question, yeah, that was great. And thank you for a great answer, Laura. Um, I know Michael had another question that he was waiting to ask. Michael, are you available to come off um, and jump in? Yeah, sure, thanks so much. That's Michael uh, Johnson with uh, Siemens Energy in uh, Montreal. I've been, well, I just, completed a journey of doing an internal startup and we were looking at powering remote mines like with green energy which is already like a huge challenge so my question is kind of around that right like a lot of mines are remote off-grid they're running on diesel they're probably not going to get off diesel in the very near future um limited availability of wind and solar and capex and all this stuff so you know if we're thinking about like a direct air capture like at a remote site that you would suck like it i don't know to me it doesn't make sense like you're emitting co2 from all the mining equipment how are you going to power the direct air capture there's kind of like a kind of stuck in a bit of a nexus there or are you bringing co2 from elsewhere transporting it then there's cost complexity logistics so i'm not sure what's your view on uh, on how to sort of pull that apart and uh, make progress there i can give a quick answer to that one um I, yes, you're definitely right that there will be geographic limitations and just infrastructure limitations on the ability to mineralize tailings with renewable energy. Um, but flue gas can also be injected. I mean, you getting to a mine to net neutral is equally as, as extremely impressive at this point. Um, so I think that's a really lofty goal. Um, so it's not it's carbon avoidance. Uh, so it's not carbon removal, but it's still definitely a worthwhile uh, goal to pursue. And does that scale, I guess, like, I don't know, there, we, there's probably some metrics around like how much energy it takes per ton. I know for diff it depends on different ores and concentrations and stuff like that, but do you have any idea of that? If, if an iron mine or if, I don't know, a nickel mine, uh, you know, for the amount of energy they consume to dig that stuff up, the CO2 that's emitted by that, is there enough tailings to offset it just in an order of magnitude, if you have any idea? So that I, if you wanna shoot me a, either a Slack or um, a LinkedIn message, I can point you in the direction of some publications that answer that. Thank you, thanks. Okay, okay. great. Yeah, I'd like to add, the way I think about it is it's a race, right? We need 24 times the lithium we're producing now in a few decades, right? And the seams that mining companies are working with, let's just say in general, are not as productive as they might have been in the past. So you're adding energy for a lower yield to achieve greater volume. That's a recipe for more and more emissions. So at the same time as that runner is headed down the road, the other runner thinking about decarb is trying to keep up and run alongside and ideally ahead of them. So the equation you're talking about is how do I compare energy and availability of carbonization opportunity with the speed and scale and cost of being able to decarbonize? That's very mind specific and you know it's the whole ball game. So um, add into that on the economic side of the second runner, are there incentives? Where's the $135 a ton? Will that happen in the regulatory uncertainty that Andre mentioned? And you have a really wild west opportunity for all these companies. I don't think anybody knows, has a crystal ball with those numbers, um, but in general, there appears to be great decarb op opportunity. Okay, great. Ignatius, I see you with your hand up there. Do you wanna jump in quickly and ask a, a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was really getting down to some a uh, bit more specifics. Do you have a handle on the sorts of percentages um, you've spoken about ca uh, calcium and magnesium? Um, but what do you consider high proportions in the tailings or in the, the material that you're working with? And does it work across any of the other cations? Um, any other materials? For example, you can carbonate iron or aluminium, um, and there's even reactions with silicon. Um, has, has anybody explored those or have you got any ideas about this, you know, 
what are the sweet spots or the, the economic sort of levels that you're looking at? I might uh, start and then throw it to Peter uh, to always get the geologist's perspective on this. Um, but when I say hi, and again, I deal with maybe tailings that don't react with ambient CO2. What I work with in my lab is about 10 to 20% on average uh, by mass calcium or magnesium. And then when you're talking about other types of carbonates, iron, um, I know there's a lead carbonate. Uh, they do exist, yes, and you can get them, but I think there's a little bit more of a trick in there, being that in iron, you have a bunch of different oxidation states. It's not exactly a, a two plus when you think about the periodic table. And so that makes carbonating get a little bit more of a trickier reaction to actually conduct, whereas because calcium and magnesium are already in that type of chemical state, they can be carbonated a bit more readily. And then there's also kind of the, the flip side and the economic argument that says if you have iron, do you really want to carbonate it? Or if you have iron, do you want to maybe smelt it and use it as like low carbon uh, for low carbon iron for steel? making but that that's my thoughts non-legal thoughts but peter i'd be interested if you have a you have a plus one or a minus one to that yeah quickly in giving uh time for more questions um so yeah if all retailings were react at like the 10 to 20 percent that would be great um especially to ambient condition ambient co2 um the ones that do react to ambient co2 um, that's generally through the mineral presence of the mineral brucite, and that's anywhere on the order of, you know, one, two, I say 22%, but that was in a single sample. So let's say like one to 6%. Um, so that's kind of the, uh, the ballpark you're looking at. And that, but keep in mind, that's ultra low cost though, since you can use CO2, um, you know, anywhere in the air. Ultra low cost is always something you like to hear, right? Um, Andrew, I do see the Uber hand up as well, but I know that Ray Savage has been waiting to get up, but his hand function isn't working. Ray, are you able to come off and, yeah. and ask your question? <clears throat> yeah, it's, um, it's Reese. <laughs> oh, sorry, Reese. thank you. It's a Welsh, Welsh name. Um, yeah, just a couple of points. Just to point out, Andrew's point was really important and kind of answered half my question. But just to give a bit of context, I'm just finishing up my PhD. I'm working on carbon mineralization of tailings and waste rock at Kvitsa, one of Belieden's nickel uh, operations. I think one of the big things I wanted to point out is uh, like sort of leading off what Andre said, I think that there needs to be a real evaluation of how startups approach mining companies. It's not a case of going in and trying to show them that they could do carbon capture, their stuff has potential, because often operators don't want to make changes to operations in the middle of the mining process. They're a lot of the way through their permitting. They've already got a system in place. They're trying to deal with other externalities like acid mine drainage is a major problem at all these mines. I think a lot of people are viewing this in the wrong way. It has to be carbon capture plus something else. So carbon capture needs to add to their process, not become a detractant because in a lot of ways it is. Because if you're telling a mining company, they now have to mill their tailings, they have to mill their waste rock, you're adding an extra step that becomes a deterrent for a lot of the operators because they they can't take that extra step in a sense because the operational costs increase it becomes a big bigger problem than it is actually a positive for them because there's no monitoring reporting and verification at the moment standardized for mining operations especially tailings and waste rock there's no incentive for them to do it right now so the big thing is for startups to go in with like metal recovery, remining, how are we going to integrate this into mining operations? Not to sort of sit back and say, okay, you just want to do carbon capture because it's never just carbon capture. It has to be something else because otherwise it's not pointless to the mining companies, but it's too difficult in the current economic sense because my, my PhD is uh, sort of centered around how carbon capture affects acid mine drainage and the geochemical evolution of drainage systems at mines. And like I'm viewing it as like I've worked with Belieden and, and my push through with Belieden and progress we've made is we're integrating this into their sort of mining operations to become something that affects their mine drainage uh, and how we can look at metal recovery and try to develop a potential MRV system. And I think unless you angle it so the mine companies see it as a positive in their operations as is 
it's going to be slow traction. And I'm just interested to see how the panel look at it because like I've seen some of the work UBC have done, Peter, like I've very uh, well read up on Greg Dimple's work. And like there's problems with like diffusion limitation and tailings. You've got crusting of the first foot or so, like the work that's been done in Nickel West. And I think it's, you need to go in with solutions rather than just carbon capture, if that makes sense. Yeah, this is, this is a great perspective. Where we are at time, so I understand if people have to drop. For those who can still stay on, we're going to keep the discussion going just a few more minutes before we go into breakout rooms um, and networking. Does anybody want to take that, take a response there about how, how we're approaching with more than just carbon capture? I'll just second Reese's point that co-benefits are going to, particularly in this uncertain regulatory environment, be critical. And there's a list of potential co-benefits, some of which you mentioned, some others have been discussed here, like geotechnical stabilization, lower leaching, et cetera. You can't expect additional energy and materials management just for carbon capture. We agree. Yeah, likewise. Um... The idea of coupling carbon capture with something else is always on our mind, and that is something we're actively thinking about. I'll just give a third to that ditto that, you know, this is kind of a central business problem of finding the values in your proposition and where are the places you can make revenue. And I think right now there's a lot of excitement over decarbonized products, over co-recovery. And so I definitely think there's a lot of, lot of opportunity in this space to come with more than just carbon storage. Sounds like this could have been like a three-parter, this, this event right here. Jason, yeah. do you want to do you want to give us some updates on upcoming Air Miners events? Sure, sure. Well, uh, first of all, let me say that this final point, um, kind of meeting a potential client or customer where they're at, that's fundamental to the way, to our philosophy of where carbon rule startups have to be, which is emphasized very heavily in our Air Miners Launchpad program, which I shared a link for in the chat just now. Um, also, uh, please, please, please let us know any kind of feedback for this in the audience feedback survey that I provided a link to, good, bad, and different. We want to hear it. We want to make these events as best as possible for you, our audience, and you, our community. A um, couple of other events coming up uh, in two weeks. We're going to have a cutting edge of CDR event uh, that you can attend, uh, similar to this event today. Uh, tomorrow, for those in air miners, we are going to have a policy kind of slack huddle chat uh, in the policy channel about this IPCC report you might have heard a little bit about, as well as the uh, CDR Leadership Act that was just uh, introduced into the US uh, Congress. So uh, should be a very interesting clubhouse style audio only chat discussion for those in air miners. Also shared a link to our main air miners site and application if you want it for those of you who want to apply to join air miners Slack. So with that, uh, I'm going to say thank you for an excellent conversation to uh, our panelists, uh, to, 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 Ka to Catherine, Peter, Laura, and especially Siobhan for uh, jumping in and moderating this. Um, hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did to listen to the comments and insights here. Uh, like I said earlier, we're going to hang on for our networking break afterwards. I'm going to stop the recording and then we'll be on our way. So thank you everyone and feel free to stay for networking and we'll see you then. See you this in was our super next fun. Air Miners event. Thanks everybody. Thanks Air Miners. Thanks. Thank you,